Bob, welcome back to the Smart Passive Income podcast. It's been uh, almost a decade now. <laughs> it's been a very long time. It's, it's been a very long time. Um, if I were to ask you, what has happened to you in the past 10 years, uh, how would you answer that in a single paragraph? Oh, man, my life has completely changed in the last 10 years. Really? Yeah. Yeah. In what way? Um, I like to make stuff. The company that I have has completely changed. It was me in my garage building some stuff. Now we have a team of six people. We have a, a building that we've purchased. We have... Uh, an online course, another one on the way. We're building a podcast system, not a network, but like a bunch of podcasts together. Um, we're, we're just doing a bunch of stuff. Dude, congratulations. Thank you. That's awesome. How is the YouTube channel doing? I'm assuming it's still the main driver for the... Yeah, it is. Um, it's it's doing well compared to the, the rest of YouTube. I don't know how how deep you are into how YouTube is working at a big scale right now, but it's very different than it was a few years ago. Kind of deep into it. Like, yeah. I know a lot has changed, shorts come about, and the algorithm has changed. Like, when you say it's different, like, what do you mean? I think the audience has, I've found in the last maybe two or three years specifically, pandemic or era, but not strictly because of the pandemic, the audience has changed a lot. Whereas it used to be YouTube was like this layback kind of thing I'm put on, like during lunch or, you know, in the evening after you, you know, kids are in bed or whatever, you just put it on. Mm. Viewing habits have changed a lot, and it's trickled down to us in a way that has made the audience kind of unknowable. This is one of the frustrated, I'm, I'm frustrated with YouTube in certain ways right now, as a platform, not as a company. Sure. One of the things is that the audience that we're trying to reach is becoming more and more unknowable. Mm. And so we've been wrestling with that a lot the last couple of years, still going well, but I want to know the people that we're trying to affect, we're trying to have a personal effect on people's lives. And so when we don't know who they are and where they are and what they want, that it's difficult. Doesn't YouTube give you some of that, like their geolocation or, you know, all that kind of stuff? Like what, what are you specifically looking to? I mean, I would like to know why people care about the things that they care about. So the algorithm, YouTube algorithm stuff is, is very focused, as it should be, on the user's habits to get the user the thing that YouTube thinks they want to see. Right. But that doesn't turn around to us as creators, as to people who are creating the thing that you want to get in front of people. We don't really get evidence of what they want. We just have to shotgun content, shotgun output, and see what happens to work. Mm -hmm. But also one of the problems, um, let's say problem, it's actually a kind of a blessing. When, when you grow, when your audience gets bigger and big, bigger, it becomes more nebulous it's like more unknowable the more people there are mm. so that shotgun blast becomes a little bit less effective over the years as the audience grows that's so, true yeah. i've been doing a lot of youtube stuff recently the audience knows i've started this pokemon channel yeah. i've had the pat flynn channel for over a decade now how has your approach to youtube changed since you first started like when you are filming or about to record a video how do you approach that now versus what you did before uh, I mean, not a whole lot has changed. I think now, because I have a team of awesome people who are all really good at stuff, mm. I don't have to try to do the bare minimum across the board. I can lean on the fact that they're going to be able to do things visually better. Uh, we do pre-production meetings now, so we really talk about what we're trying to get across with the, this video. What's the point of it? What's the takeaway, the thesis? And that's something I was never able to do by myself because there's just too much to do when you're running the whole show on your own. Mm -hmm. And so now being able to go into a video and say, like, I personally, me, I want to make this thing, whatever this physical thing is, how do we make this valuable for other people who don't necessarily want this thing? What can we, what value can we give them? And so we talk about, like, what's the thesis? What are they going to take away from it? Not necessarily how to make the thing, but maybe a, a skill set or an understanding of a material or at the most basic level, a motivation to try to do something that they couldn't do before. Mm. That's the entire point of my job, is to let everybody that I run into with my content know that they're capable of more than they've done in the past. You can do more. You can do the things that you want. And a lot of people don't ever get told that. So that's the one of the kind of pillars of what we do. And so that works into our pre-production, into our discussions about what content is, is how can we make an impact on those people to answer your question, that was harder to do when it was just me. Mm -hmm. There's too many things going on. So, Can you give me an example of a video or something that you've made and how it's gone beyond that item or, or thing you built? Um, it happens in a lot, of, <laughs> a lot of weird ways, a lot of small ways across a lot of different videos. Um, 
so I dabbled with leatherworking. I'm not very good at any of the things that I do, but I get to dabble with different things every week. So that's mm -hmm. pretty cool. So with leatherworking, one time I just decided to make a wallet that I still carry. I've got it in my pocket. And it was more of a, hey, this will be a fun thing to try. I've never tried it before. And we put that video out and it did okay. But the feedback we got from people was, hey, I didn't realize that you didn't have to have any real specialized tools. I didn't realize that you could do all of this work that you're doing you know, on a mat in front of you at a table. I don't need a shop. I don't need anything more than a table. And so people were reaching out and saying like, I've always discounted uh, the possibilities because I didn't have a, a place to do it. But now I realize that I could make that wallet that you made at my kitchen table with very few tools. And that's awesome. So people who oh. just live in apartments, people who, you know, are kids who live with their parents, like they have uh, something that is accessible to them now that wasn't before they saw that video. Now, was that planned? Like, no, 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 no. no. It just, <laughs> no. I mean, I think the, the planning in that one was, well, it wasn't like, let's film this in this location that others can relate to because it's not like a fancy no. factory or anything like that. No, it's still in my shop, but it, it uh, you know, the scope of something matters a lot when you're trying to get people to understand it. And when the scope is all in one little, when it's shot around one little area, they don't mm -hmm. feel overwhelmed. They don't feel like they're in a big wood shop with lots of tools that they don't understand or know or have access to. When they see that it's right in front of a person with tools that they're holding in their hand that are very small and not very expensive, it's just a different scale. And it reaches people who are living in a different scale, a different place than I am. I love that. Yeah. You know, I think inherently everybody likes to make stuff, right? Yeah. But we don't often believe that we can. Exactly. Um, that might be the big difference between a channel like yours and then one of my other favorite channels, which is primitive technology, yeah. <laughs> which is like he's building stuff in his in the bush in yeah. Australia. Yeah. But it's like, I'm never going to do that. But that's super entertaining because I don't know what this what this is going to turn into. But a wallet, it's like we all know what a wallet looks like. But you make this something that is maybe more accessible to people. Um, yeah. And so have people sent you pictures of the wallets that they've built or anything like that? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, we get pictures of all sorts of stuff. Uh, I also do the opposite of, of things like wallets that are utility, useful, small. I also make things that are ridiculous that nobody else should ever make. Like I like the Transformers from the 80s. So I made a... Exactly. Yeah. That's it. So I made a Soundwave boom box that's about this big. It's got a Bluetooth speaker in it. And it just looks like the tape recorder. Yeah. Two days ago, a friend of mine from college sent me pictures of another Transformer, the Autobot version of that same cassette player. Yeah. This guy made, because he saw my video like three years ago. No way. And he wanted to make one, so he made the opposite, you know, version of it, the good guy version of yeah. it. And it's beautiful. He made it out of like hardwood. It's it's gorgeous. Way better than the one that I made. But, you know, so it doesn't have to be uh, something small and utilitarian or to, to have an impact on somebody. So it's really cool that I get to experiment with all the different scales and all the different materials. And they can still hit somebody in the right spot. Love that. Yeah. Now, since I'm talking to a fellow YouTuber, I have to ask you, what's a video that you put a ton of time into, you thought it was going to blow up, and it just kind of bombed? <sighs> I'm going to say most of them. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, what? <laughs> well, okay, so for one thing, we what we do at I Like to Make Stuff is almost never, it, it almost never has the potential for virality. It's not the point. And so we decided, I decided a long time ago that I wanted to end up, end my career with a, a library of useful things. I don't necessarily want to have like huge spikes, uh, you know, of videos that just go crazy and then the next one's like terrible. Mm -hmm. I just want them to be useful long term for everybody. I like that. And because of that, that means that I don't do the, the Colin Furs, Mark Rober, just like, I'm going to go bigger. I'm going to go crazier. It just that doesn't fit with me. It's not my personality. Mm -hmm. And so because of that, we don't really, I put in a lot of work to, to as many videos as I can, but we don't have the ones that spike up, which means they all, I'm not saying they, they spike down. I'm not saying they're terrible, but we don't have the outliers up and down so much to where it feels like I've put in all this work and this one just really bombed. Mm. It's, it's kind of a strange way to look at being um, successful on YouTube because yeah. success comes in in big numbers, but I really want to play the long game and have an effect on people, and that doesn't equate to big numbers all the time. 
when we see YouTubers like Mr. Beast yeah. spend three million dollars on a Squid Games sort of reenactment, or you know Ryan Trahan rent an island and spend overnight like in the middle of the ocean or something random, um, we feel like we have to go extravagant. We have to go huge right. to, just to keep up. H how are you sort of grounding yourself with relation to that? Like you said, and and what advice would you offer? a starter YouTuber who's like, I don't have the money, I don't have the time or resources to go huge like that. How can I still create videos that help people but also are fun? Well, I mean, I think, and this is something I've heard you say before, I, I really think figuring out the value that you're trying to give somebody ahead of time before you do any work is the guiding principle for what you do. And so uh, I don't know personally, the value that those big over the top things are providing other than pure entertainment. And that's worth a lot. Mm -hmm. So I'm not trying to discount that. But um, I think if you if you figure out the value that you want somebody, anybody who watches to take away, it's easier to backfill the content to that value proposition rather than I just want to make something big and then hope that people like it. That That's a dangerous, very risky, very expensive way to live <laughs> yeah and so um that's not what we do um i think we have a, a kind of three pillars we have some core principles and from those we can decide whether it getting it across this week requires something big or if it requires making a wallet or if it requires just showing you know something simple or something obvious or something just like a table that's useful mm -hmm. people need tables right so sometimes that is the thing that actually gets the value to the person that needs it love it thank you for that um i want to ask you about your team okay. who's like literally sitting over there in the corner watching uh, <laughs> us right now so um they're awesome by the way got they to are. meet them earlier and work with them uh i want to know how you found your team and what what that was like for you a lot of creators when they start working with a team it can be very difficult uh, to learn how to let go of some things, for example, like yeah. did you find any challenges and uh, with that growth? Um, yeah, I mean, there's there's definitely challenges to growth. Adding people to something that you care a lot about is always a little bit scary. It's always a little bit not dangerous, but you know, you lose control of some things. Mm -hmm. I have had companies in the past. Uh, I had a design firm for a long time, and we at one point employed about thirty people. So I've had experience with scale. Um, and I don't really like it. I don't want that scale again. I would rather have a small team of people that I really care about and that I know and that are really good at what they do, and that's what we have now. And I built that up um, through a lot of just kind of personal relationship. Like the first guy that started working with me has been one of my closest friends for years, and I don't even remember how long I've known him. And so having him and his skill set involved from the very beginning has been huge. Mm -hmm. And then the next person was somebody that I kind of knew through the channel and uh, was just eager to help. And so he helped and then we needed somebody to run camera. And I found this random dude on Instagram who's now a good friend of ours. He's been with us for like three years. And that just worked out. I didn't know him ahead of time. Um, and then recently we've hired Megan, who's been a friend of a friend. You know, like we all know each other from different places and stuff. So it's very relational mm -hmm. and uh, for me, that's the safest way and the the quickest way to build a team is like if you trust somebody and they don't have the skill set, you can trust them to learn the skill set. But if you find somebody has a skill set that you don't trust, there's it's not worth it at all. So that's kind of how I go about it. Your first hire as a YouTuber was for which sort of position or what job? or um, Editor. Editor. Yeah. Would you recommend that to be most people's probably first I hires. I mean, I think there, a lot of that has to do with personality. I know some people um, who absolutely love the editing, YouTubers who love the editing more than the shooting or mm. the being on camera. Like that's the thing that they really get out of it. So maybe, I don't know. It depends on the, I, I follow the principle. Uh, I don't remember who said it, somebody very famous about like make three lists of the things that you have to do, the things that you only do because you they have to get done, and the things that you don't want to do. Yeah. Something to that effect. That was uh, Chris Ducker, uh, Three Lists of Freedom. Yeah. Actually, from yeah. Virtual Freedom. Yeah. So I've, I followed that for a very long time. Yeah. So He'll be happy to, to hear that. Now, beyond YouTube, I mean, you're monetizing on YouTube. What are some other ways that you have grown this business to generate revenue? So a few years ago, we started making digital plans for not everything we make, but a lot of the things we make um, they are general enough that somebody else might want to make it. 
as well. Mm -hmm. So we make a set of digital plans uh, that are really inexpensive. People can get them. They have a all the information for like the cuts that they need to make, the material they need to buy, and then step by step how to build it themselves. Like and then that they, wallet or the table or yeah, like all oh, those kinds of yeah. things. So and then they've got the video to follow as well, where I explain in depth. So that has worked out really well for us because it's an inexpensive way for somebody to to take something that they see that inspires them and immediately have everything technically that they need to execute it themselves, to do it in their own home or whatever. You know? Yeah. So that's been really big for us. And um, we also... Uh, How do you sell that? Like what platforms are you using to, to distribute that? We sell all that on our own website. Um, I like to make stuff.com. Yeah. Yep. Uh, so we've got a store there with merch and stuff and we sell you know, those digital plans there. And then we put out a, a online course about two years ago at the beginning of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. That was, we were all distributed everybody was alone so we're like all right this is the time to finally do the course so we did a course on learning fusion 360 which is a 3d modeling software which oh, okay. is what we use to design the model for this podcast case like yes we, so we use this software all the time to pre-visualize what we're going to build we built rooms and like my entire kitchen we built in there and then i got to build the kitchen from the model so which cool. was really cool so we taught people how to use that and that's been a significant part of our income for the past couple of years. How are you, like what platforms are you using? We're to using sell Podia. Podia, okay. Yeah. Um, um, and then how did you release that to the world when you finally had it built? We did kind of a soft release to our Patreon supporters, people that we already knew were kind of like on our side and would be interested. Sure. And then we just made a little ad for it and put it on the main YouTube channel. And now every time we build something with Fusion, which is pretty much every week, we can always say like, this is Plug what in. we're using. You know, if you want to learn how to do this, it's not that hard and we can teach you how to do it. How much is the course? It's $120. 120. How many people are coming in per month if you want to give us an idea? Gosh, that I don't know. You have any idea? I don't know. We've sold we've sold a couple of thousand of them. That's amazing. Yeah. I mean, that makes sense though. That's something that people are seeing you use, so they trust you and they trust that it's work. It's it works. Yeah. Um and 120 is not a terrible price for something that can build you something in real life. You right. Know? Yeah. That's really awesome. Um, and you had mentioned Patreon just now. Tell mm -hmm. me about that and how you incorporate that into the business. So Patreon is one of those things. I signed up for Patreon the day I've, I've been a follow, uh, like followed Jack Conte's stuff for a very long time. Yeah. So the, the minute I saw his video where he announced Patreon, I was like, I'm in. So I, I'm pretty sure I'm in the top five like signups. Wow. <laughs> But I've been using it from the very beginning, but I'm terrible at using it. I'm terrible at promoting that mechanism for people to support. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure why. I always have been. Um, so it's never been a very significant part of our revenue. And it's pr that's probably going to change. We're at a point now where we're f spending so much time fighting the YouTube algorithm to get our content in front of the people who already want to see it, mm -hmm. that we know. They sign the button, or they click the button, you know. They, they, and the bell. And yeah. yeah. So that mechanism, I think, is is problematic for a lot of creators. So we're about to make a pretty big push to Patreon direct support to just bypass all of the the hoops and the, the things that we don't understand that we, like I was saying earlier, that are unknowable. I don't want to deal with that. Mm -hmm. I want to make good stuff for the people that want to see it. And if that means that that group of people is a smaller group of people, that's fine. Um, but I want to be able to get it to the people I want. So we're about to dive into leaning on Patreon as a direct communication tool and a direct support tool way more than we ever have. That's in the next couple of weeks, probably. Are there any plans? That sounds amazing, yeah. actually. And um, are there any plans to bring people together to be able to communicate with each other? Yeah. So we have we call our our group the Maker Alliance. So we've got YouTube members and Patreon that are all under that same banner, mm -hmm. and we've got a a pretty active Discord server that is behind that that paywall. So um, it's not the Wild West like a lot of Discord is. Mm -hmm. um, so we've got a really amazing group. In fact, this group of people set up a maker summer camp the maker alliance did this without us they decided to have a summer camp where they all got together they rented this lodge got together and had welding classes they did a pinewood derby we had wow. D D, all this stuff and they they came up with this whole idea and then they brought it to us and said you know like can we do this it's got your name on it we don't want to like overstep a bound 
And it was such a good plan and such a community focused thing. I was like, I, I, I don't want the liability of the thing that you're trying to do, but I would love to help. So mm -hmm. we ended up kind of being a sponsor for it. And so maybe three weeks ago, four weeks ago, they showed up in our town. It happened. It happened. And it was amazing. That's so cool. Yeah, it was, it was incredible. So that community of people is very tight. In fact, they are tight because of the community, not because of us, mm -hmm. which is really interesting that the people who supported us ended up just liking each other enough that they've, I think they stick around for each other more than they do yeah. for us, which is great. That's fine. Because they are looking for ways to do what we hope to do for other people. They want to build people up. They want to empower people to make stuff and help each other with you know problems and uh, you know technical problems while they're building stuff. It's incredible, and that's all through Discord. How does a non gamer use and manage Discord? A non gamer um, creator. Um, you hire somebody that understands. Oh, okay, it. there you go. <laughs> yeah. So one of our team members, I mean, a couple, a couple of guys on our our team have a lot of experience with Discord. I personally use it like Slack. We use Slack for in their inner office communication stuff, and it feels exactly the same to me. That's yeah. how I use it. Um, and so, you know, the team has the uh, the basic integrations with Patreon and YouTube stuff, so that it you don't have to worry about people coming in and out. That Authenticate, all yeah, it all happens in, sure. naturally. And then, um, I don't know, you, you put good people in, in moderator positions and they can kind of keep track of everything. So I luckily don't have to do very much of that myself. Yeah, <laughs> that's cool. I yeah. see Discord being used a lot more now outside yeah. of that yeah. sort of gamer community. Um, and it's become a really amazing home for a lot of people. Yeah. Um, I want to ask you to finish up about podcasting. We're on a podcast right now. Obviously, sure. we are video recording this and so everybody listening is welcome to check it out on youtube or the clips that we put there i don't even know exactly how we're gonna chop this up uh for for, for the video viewers but um i know you also have a podcast right you're primarily a youtuber video creator but you have podcasts or podcasts and tell me about what podcasting is like from a youtuber's perspective like what are your thoughts about it well, as a platform um i love podcasting i really enjoy it uh i wish i could do more of it mm -hmm. and and i told you before we started recording that one of the problems with podcasting for me personally is i can't figure out how to make it financially worthwhile and so most of what i've done podcasting wise has just been because i enjoy it and i like interviewing people and i like having conversations with a few friends that we do these shows with and so it's a way for us to do community building more than anything else mm. and so it, it makes it, you know, we have to balance how much of it we do because it doesn't really bring in a lot of money, but it's really valuable to certain people. So we're always kind of towing this line of how much effort, how much time, how much money do we put into building up a podcast that doesn't really turn a profit. Right. Um, so we've got one that's that's focused on making stuff, and it's with David Picciuto and Jimmy Duresta, both have their own very successful YouTube channels. And that one... Uh, we've heard from a lot of people is just it's a way for a lot of people who are in their workshops by themselves to feel like they're not by themselves. It's like they got mm -hmm. buddies in their workshops with them. And that goes a long way. So regardless of how much money it brings in or how much effort we have to put into it, we're we're people's friends that we don't even know. Mm -hmm. And so that that carries a lot of weight. For That's me. how it's building the community. Yeah. yeah. Right. Is that a publicly available podcast? Mm -hmm. or? Yeah, it is. What's the name of it? It's called Making It. Way before the TV show. Um, <laughs> yeah. And so we also do, that one is Patreon supported and it always has been. So we've never done ads on it or anything. And so we have an after show that's kind of specific for Patreon supporters. Um, so that's one show. And then we have another one called No Instructions, which I and Josh, who works with me, do. And it is very like, it's all the stuff that I couldn't talk about on making it. So mm. on making it, I'm the only father. So No Instructions, we talk about fatherhood. We talk about star wars and nerd stuff that the other show just doesn't fit right sounds right up my alley actually. yeah yeah so uh and that one's fun because we sit around at a table and we talk about all that stuff that we care about and we build lego sets while we're doing it and that one doesn't have a, a support model it doesn't have a revenue stream at all but it's like another way for us to have those conversations about parenthood and about faith and about life and about all these different things that we care about that we want to talk about 
And we've heard from enough people that they want to hear about it that like we can't not do that show. It has an effect. And so even though it doesn't make any money, <laughs> we can't stop it. You know, yeah. I don't want to. You know? Love that. Not everything has to be for the money. Exactly. You know, and I'm sure that's a very fulfilling podcast to be on and sure. um you know I, I i also love the idea of podcasting for legacy purposes these mm. are captured moments that our kids and other generations can sort of listen to and learn from yeah. uh, in, in a way to live on um i want to ask you about the bill this thing that we're recording on right now to finish up okay. because i want people to go and actually head over to i like to make stuff on youtube to watch how you built this but describe what it is that everybody listening has been teased about what, what 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 is this so this is a case it's a two-part black travel case uh that unfolds and then inside of it it's got four microphones it's got a rode roadcaster pro 2 uh, which is the whole recording device it's got mic cables it's got power cables it's got headphones all that stuff is compact held in this box so that you can take it with you unload it on a table and set up in like a minute or so to record podcast and it did take literally like a minute to yeah. set up uh, and we had an interesting journey with this because I asked you for help to create this two and a half or so years yeah, ago. Yeah. Uh, and then you built it, but then the pandemic happened, so we weren't able to meet. And so here we are in person in Los Angeles right now um, doing the exchange. Yeah, finally. So if you want to see it, go check out the build on Bob's channel. I like to make stuff on YouTube. Uh, I also have a version of that video on my channel as well, Pat Flynn. Um, and th Thank you so much for this. This has been a great experience and a, a great way to catch up. And uh, Bob, if there's anything you ever need from from me, like I'm a big fan. I love your Thanks, channel man. and I uh, look forward to connecting with you in the future. Yeah, I appreciate it. Thanks for having me on. Thanks so much, brother. Good to see you.